Okay, so probably you are wondering why the topic of the speech for the big data community, for the technical community, doesn't really sound technical. And I uh, thought about what topics I could present to you. <clears throat> of course, I could choose some, uh, some uh, specific technology related uh, subject or some area which will be relevant for you right now at your project. But I uh, thought that if I do that, the knowledge which you'll get from the presentation will be relevant for you just for a limited amount of time. What I want to do today is to give you a different kind of presentation. I want to share with you a different kind of skill. It's a meta skill, which will help you to become a better knowledge worker, better engineer, and just to make your life easier in terms of uh, approaching new information and new knowledge. So today we'll be talking about why you should learn by teaching. But first, few oh, a moment. First, few words about me. My uh, my name is Dimitro Primak. Uh, I am a lead data engineer here at SoftServe, but also I am a teacher at UKU. For those who don't know what is UKU, it is Ukrainian Catholic University. It's one of the uh, best Ukrainian universities in terms of computer science programs. I've been teaching there for. Uh, two years already, and it's very, very interesting experience. And I mentioned that de deliberately because it has the uh, direct relation to our talk. Uh, today, I'll try to make the case and to share my own experience how uh, becoming a teacher, how teaching something to others made me a better data engineer and made my understanding of all the topics which I learned much better. I'll also tell you the story how eight years ago I came into teaching uh, after joining the, uh, joining the ranks of software engineers. And then after eight years last year, how teaching uh, brought me to soft server. But I'll tell that story in the end of the talk. And for now, I want to talk a little bit about the usual pain which most of the work uh, knowledge workers face almost every day. I want to ask you the question. Uh, did it ever happen to you that you are trying to learn new skill, new, uh, new technology, new topic? And when you start reading it or watching some video tutorial, everything looks obvious. Everything lo looks pretty easy. Uh, so it's a, it's a depiction of me trying to learn new things. Uh, when you go through the examples in the book, they are pretty clear and straightforward. So it, uh, it doesn't really matter what the difficult, what the uh, topic is, but it, most case, in most cases, it looks straightforward. But then, uh, but then, after let's say 10, 5, 15 minutes, you go to the kitchen, you bring the next cup of coffee, you come back and try to use this new information. For example, uh, let's imagine you are learning, uh, you are learning the foreign language. Let's say uh, English is not your native language. You learn new tense and you, uh, you saw how to use it, how to, uh, how to build the sentence, what it represents. But then after 10 or 15 minutes, when you want to translate the sentence into this, uh, when you, into this uh, foreign language using this tense, you don't really remember how to do that. Or let's say you learned a new library or new uh, tool, let's say you are, you started learning Apache Spark and you know what is the concept of the tools or uh, where, when it is used, how to, how to define the transformations and how to do everything. But then when you close the tutorial or close the window with the video and want to write some code uh, on your own, it looks like everything vanished from your head. 
for some times I thought that I am uh, that I have some really rare and strange disease which makes all the new knowledge evaporate. But as it turned out, I'm not the only one who have this problem, this limitation. Uh, and I learned and I uh, found out on my own experience that the amount of information which you consume, the number of times you read or uh, listen to or watch something doesn't really color, correlate linearly with the level of your knowledge and understanding. It happened to me a lot of times that I read the same paragraph or the same uh, piece of information a few times, but with each next reading, my knowledge increased just slightly or didn't increase at all, or sometimes even became, uh, even became worse. So uh, it worried me for, for some time uh, up until the uh, point when I discovered the new, much better approach of learning. And instead of learning by reading, or here when I'm referring to reading, I mean also watching, listening, I mean passive reading. Probably all heard about different kinds of reading, some uh, different kinds of reading, different kinds of learning, uh, active and passive uh, kinds, but I would bring them all at the same category. I mean, reading, watching, listening at the same category of uh, passive uh, passage knowledge acquisition. And I want to make the case that there is a much better way and it's learning through teaching. And you may have the uh, adequate question, isn't I supposed to know something before I can teach? Uh, isn't it, isn't it a prerequisite or a preliminary uh, condition in order to be able to teach? And to the certain extent, it's true. You need to know at least something before you can start teaching. But as I'll uh, describe in the following half an hour, uh, there is much, uh, much easier and uh, easier and uh, accessible to everyone way to use this technique. Uh, this way of learning through teaching was popularized by the famous person, Richard Feynman. Uh, he's not the first one who, came, uh, who come up with this approach to learning, but he's the most famous in terms of uh, uh, this approach. Uh, if you don't know who Richard Feynman is, he's the famous physicist. He lived in the last century. And apart from being the Nobel Prize uh, winner and uh, a really important person in quantum physics, he was a really interesting person. He was the great educator and was popular for his ability to uh, explain really difficult things with, a simple, uh, with a simple words and simple examples. Uh, uh, quite some time ago, I, uh, I read his autobiography. It's called uh, Surely, you are fine. Uh, Surely You Are Joking, Mr. Feynman. And I need to say it was one of the most influential books in my life. From there, I learned not only about him, but about his approach to, uh, to knowledge, his approach to information. Uh, I even have the phrase which I coined with my friends who also know uh, about Richard Feynman, so-called Feynman understanding. And we use this phrase when, you want to, when we want to describe the real deep understanding of some topic. And there is an uh, a, a interesting story told by Feynman himself in one of the interviews, how he, uh, how he found out the difference between the real understanding and just pretending to understand. When he was a child and he was playing with other uh, children at the, uh, in the park, one of the, uh, one of the other children came to him and said, hey, Richard, do you know what is, what is that bird? Do you know how this bird is called? And he didn't have any idea. Uh, so the child made, uh, made fun of him saying that, hey, your father is not teaching you anything. You don't even know how this bird is called. So Richard was a little bit disappointed. And when he came to his father, he asked, hey, father, and he described this situation. 
to which his father answered, you see that bird, the, the bird name is black throated thrush. And in German, it's Schwarzke Drostel. And in Spanish, it's El Zodal Papinegro. And you can know all the names of the, uh, all the names from all the languages about this bird, but you know nothing. You know nothing about how the bird lives, where it flies, what it eats, uh, what, anything about its feathers. So at this point, Richard, uh, Richard understood that there is a very big difference between knowing the name of something and understanding the topic really deeply. Also, he, uh, he, talked a uh, he talked a lot about the importance and the benefits of examples. Not only, uh, not only the definitions, but the clear visual examples which put everything in its place. And right, uh, before, uh, before, I, uh, want, before I go to the actual details of the so-called Feynman technique, of the technique how to learn through teaching, I want to uh, spend a minute or so to uh, showing you how important and helpful uh, are examples. So probably uh, some of you already know what is cap theorem. I believe you, uh, you had at least one encounter with this theorem in your work. And for those who don't know what is the, what it uh, what is all about there is a wikipedia definition so the cap theorem states that it's impossible for distributed data stores to simultaneously provide more than two out of following three guarantees so i'm i'm uh, continuing with the definition so there are three uh, there are three properties of the system consistency availability and partition tolerance and cap theorem st uh, states that you can uh, have only two of these properties at the same time. So if your network is partitioned, um, you can choose either to uh, cancel operation and uh, decrease the availability, uh, but ensure the consistency, or you can uh, proceed with the operation, but you cannot guarantee the consistency. So if you already knew this, uh, if you already knew this theorem, probably it doesn't say you anything new. But if you didn't, I'm wondering how uh, how much did you understand from the definition? Even though the definition is straightforward, but could you really? But do you really understand that? And now, with the help of a small example and a small visual example, I want to demonstrate to you what is the difference between the definition and the uh, and a really good example. So I'll switch for a little bit to another place. I'll try to explain the cap theorem for those of you who don't know what is that. So let's imagine that we have some distributed system. Let's say you have a, a bank account in some bank and most likely all of the banks uh, uh, are not using only one server. So probably their storage is uh, spread through some number of storages. So I depicted this banking system as this cloud with the boxes where each box is the server. Let's imagine that you have the uh, bank account and you have, let's say $1,000 at your bank account. Uh, you have the mobile, online banking mobile application on your phone and you gave you the card from your account to your spouse and let's you know, let's imagine the following scenario uh, in the morning at 9 a.m monday you have one thousand dollars on your account and uh at so you have one thousand dollars at 9 a.m at 9.05, your wife uh, decides that it would be good to go to buy some groceries, but she doesn't have a cash. And uh, in the market, you cannot really use the card. So it would be nice to withdraw some, uh, some money from the ATM. So she, uh, so she messages you that, hey, I'm going to withdraw $100 from the account. You say, okay, that's fine. And so she goes to the ATM, she withdraws, $100 and 
the expected behavior is that uh, in our account, you now have $900. And if you decide, so it happened at 905. And if you decide at 906 to check uh, if you have enough money for let's say paying for some new nice thing, if you go to your mobile, uh, mobile uh, application, your online banking, you expect to see this like $900 at 9.05. So it sounds pretty, uh, pretty obvious, pretty straightforward. Uh, you expect that your mobile application will work all the time. You expect to see the latest data in the screen, latest data about the state of your account. And your wife is also uh, expecting that when she comes to the ATM, it will, uh, it will uh, allow to withdraw money without any problems. So that's in the perfect uh, situation when everything works, works fine. But let's imagine the modification of this situation. Let's imagine that uh, the, let's imagine that the servers of this banking system were in two separate uh, server racks, meaning uh, let's say three of them were in one rack, other uh, three were in a different rack. And uh, right, the scenario is the similar. Uh, so at like, at 9.05, your wife decides to withdraw some, uh, some money from the ATM. She comes to the ATM, she withdraws the, withdraws $100, but uh, the server which serves the ATM was in one rack. And uh, the server which serves the, your mobile application is in a different rack. And uh, if, if something happens, let's say uh, someone accidentally unplugged the, uh, the cable in the network switch and uh, the connectivity between these two racks uh, broke down, you have the situation when uh, parts of this, uh, part of the servers of the application are not connected to the other servers. So you have the partition, you have the network partitioning, which is one of the properties, right? Or partition tolerance. So what, what potentially may happen in this situation? The money is withdrawn, but the connectivity is broken. So the system may behave in two different ways. The first way is the system can continue working or to be available, but the state of the data in the system may be inconsistent, which means that for this, uh, for this set of servers, the system thinks that you have only $900 after the withdrawal of 100, but this part of system Things that you have, you still have one thousand dollars. So it means that if you go to your mobile application, it will still show you one thousand dollars, even though you really have nine hundred. So that if this scenario goes like this, that in one one servers show you one uh, one thousand and other servers show nine hundred, it means that system is inconsistent or the consistency is broken. And uh, uh, coming back to the cap theorem, what it, what it says that in case if the network is partitioned, if the, there is a, a partitioning of the network in the system, you can choose only one of the properties. You can either have system available, but it will give the inconsistent data across the system. Or another scenario, your mobile app will say, I'm sorry, uh, there is something, uh, something happened with the system, please come back later. So it will guarantee that it won't show you the inconsistent data. It won't show you inconsistent state, but it won't be available. 
So you as a developer, as a designer of the system can choose how, how your system will behave. Either it will be available if the partition tolerance happened or it will be consistent. So that's the alternative of explanation how the cap theorem works. And let's come back to the, let's come back to the presentation. So now when you saw the, uh, the same explanation through the example, I believe, but uh, once again, it refers only to those people who didn't know what the cap theorem is. Uh, hopefully now you understand it a little bit more than from the definition. I hope you understand it. And I want to offer you a bet. And I am willing to bet that if uh, you didn't know this theorem before, and after you understand it right now, tomorrow in the evening, you won't be able to, uh, you wouldn't be able to describe this theorem without using the same example. What I mean that I'm, I'm pretty, I can be pretty sure that only one exposure to the information isn't enough, isn't enough for the, detail, for the detailed enough knowledge uh, the knowledge which you may use for like for the actual uh, in your actual work and what may be the reason for that uh, probably you also saw the examples of this for example when you are learning new words from different language or you are learning new constructs from the program for a new programming language when you read the text, when you read the code, it looks pretty clear. You understand what is happening. But at the moment when you need to remember the word or if you need to remember the, to re recall the way how the construction is used, you may have some difficulties. And the reason for that is uh, these two activities, even though they look similar because it may, it may seem to you if I, understand something, if I can recognize what it means, probably I can recall it, but, it not, but it's not really the case. It uh, requires using the different regions of the brain, the different mechanisms in the brain. So recognition is not really the same as recollection. And in order to be able to recall any new information, you need to practice recalling it. And as I'll show you with this Feynman method, with the method for learning through teaching. In this method, you are actively, you are actively utilizing the recollection circuits, the recollection mechanisms, which brings you much better understanding and much better retention of the knowledge. So, uh, uh, so finally, we get to the Feynman method itself. And it's pretty simple. simple. It contains only four steps. First, you study in the way you know. I mean, you either read something or watch something. You get some initial knowledge, some initial information about the topic which is interesting to you or which you need to learn for whatever purposes. And when you get this initial way of under, initial uh, level of understanding and knowledge, you try to explain it. You try to teach it to someone. And later I'll address the situations when you don't have anyone to teach it to, but you can simulate it by uh, taking the piece of paper and pretending that you are explaining it to someone. Or as I will, as I will uh, show some other alternatives, you can do it through like video recordings or something like that. So the step two is you try to explain. And as you will see, when you are explaining, your knowledge is much worse than you thought before you start. Uh, we have the tendency to skip the parts uh, when we are thinking about some concept. We have a tendency to skip the some very very often pretty big parts and pretend that we understand them. Uh, and, but actually, we have like a blind spots. We have a knowledge gaps where we think we know how it works, but we don't. 
And when you try to explain it, when you start to ask questions about your definitions, about your, uh, about the concepts which you are trying to explain, you start to, uh, to spot the gaps. And that's the third step of the Feynman method. You study again to fill the gaps. By study again, I mean first uh, during the second step, during the explanation, you identified the gaps. For example, you identified that you don't know how, uh, let's say if we uh, for a moment come back to the cap theorem uh, and you, you, may, you may start to explain it in the way uh, the cap, the cap theorem says that uh, every distributed uh, data storage can have only two of three uh, properties, partition tolerance, availability, and consistency. Looks like pretty fair explanation. But then you can uh, notice that, do you really understand what consistency means or what availability means or what partition tolerance means, how they are in interconnected? And after, when you start explaining, you see these gaps and your next step is to go back to the information or to find new information which can answer your questions, which can fill in the gaps. And then you do this process uh, iteratively enough times to fill all the gaps which you spotted. It's pretty likely that uh, there will be uh, more gaps, some of them which you didn't know, didn't notice, but at least it uh, it will be helpful to fill the gaps which you which you found. So uh, why teaching helps? Uh, I think that this picture represents pretty uh, precisely how how the ideas and knowledge is represented in our heads. For those of you who uh, who had a closer look how serialization works in the computer system and why it's needed. So it's pretty similar. In your head, you have the tangled, uh, tangled bunch of interconnected, sometimes not very structured thoughts and uh, pieces of information. Uh, you kind of know what it, why it works, how it works, when it works, but in order to but in order to communicate it to someone, in order to teach, you need to put it into the uh, into the representation, which can be uh, transmitted through some communication channel. By, by communication channel, I mean either oral or through writing or through pictures. It doesn't really matter. The trick is that you need to take this complex, interconnected, tangled, and unstructured representation from your brain and put it into some meaningful, systematic, and structured uh, representation in, or in order to communicate it. And as you will see with practice, it really helps. First of all, it helps you to, it helps you to think through the information to, system, to uh, put it into its proper shelves in your mental bookshelf and then to formulate and articulate it in the way which is clear for you which is understandable for others and which may be helpful for others. Also, let me present you uh, another story from my uh, life. When I, so as a data engineer, I was using Cassandra database for quite some time uh, for years. But then when I came to the university, I mean, as a teacher uh, and in the course of learning the, uh, the introduction to big data and big data processing, I decided also to teach a little bit about Cassandra. So before I went to the, uh, as a teacher, the process of, of writing to Cassandra looked something like this. So I knew that there is a cluster with few nodes. Uh, I, uh, if I need to write some uh, information into the cluster, I have like, I have a data, it goes to the cluster, some, uh, important and pretty complex things happen uh, on the way and that and data uh, appears in the cluster. I didn't really think how it works because it was working. But after, uh, after I uh, encountered it through the different lens, through, through the different lens, when I uh, was preparing to describe the process of writing, 
it turned out that writing to Cassandra is much more than just some writing magic. Uh, first, when you want to describe the process of writing, you start asking the questions. So first of all, how, do, how does the data know where it will go in the cluster? Because cluster consists of many nodes. And how do you know which exact node will receive the data? So it brings uh, me to the, to the concept of consistent hashing. Also, um, this uh, uh, principle of consistent hashing brings me to the particular implementation of, of it in Cassandra. So it brings to the concept of uh, virtual nodes and the uh, ring of the keys. Uh, then it brings to the other question of partition key. How it, uh, what, is the, what is this key? How it is used? How, uh, how the uniqueness is uh, organized, how I can approach the choosing of this key in order to make the data uh, storage efficient. Then it brings to the other uh, questions of uh, consistency levels and how to, uh, or how to provide this consistency levels about the uh, question of quorums. And it's just a start when I, when I prepare to the lectures and then there was, and then there was a pretty big set of questions from my students, which I didn't anticipate. For example, how the, uh, what happens with the data if it is, if it becomes too big? It brought me to the concept of compaction. Then uh, is it, uh, uh, how does the system checks uh, if the data exists in the system, which brought to Bloom filters and to, the way how the uh, how the records are organized in memory, like mem tables, commit log, LSM trees, and uh, how the data is replicated. So it turned out that from this small placeholder, from this uh, generic uh, generic unspecified pretense of knowledge, I went to the much much bigger area of questions, topics, and uh, concepts which are related to this particular topic. And it's just a write to Cassandra, but also there is a read, also there is a, a maintenance and, and much, much more. So this process of preparing to lectures, then teaching them and then getting and answering the question opened really, really big horizon of new knowledge, of new understanding. But you may ask, uh, but wait a minute, this process of teaching through, uh, of learning through teaching is really time consuming and it's really, uh, it's really effortful. And yes, I need to agree that it's really effortful and time consuming. You, it requires a lot of concentration. It requires a lot of work and a lot of time for, from you. But if you put it into the bigger perspective, if you compare it with the time spent for a passive learning, passive reading, passive watching, and the ratio of time spent for the learning and then level of understanding for learning through teaching, the difference is huge. So for each, uh, so let's say you'll spend two days of reading and watching some new material about some topic, and then your understanding will, will be, let's say 50 points, in some abstract way of, uh, it, it's like abstract points of understanding. But for the same two days of intensive concentrated work for learning through teaching, you can get at least twice as that understanding. Uh, but I understand that for all the topics, you cannot really use this approach. because There are so many topics which, we, which you want to learn, but so so uh, small amount of time and for this i can offer you some other alternatives like writing tutorials it's really helpful uh, it's similar to it's like a sub uh, subset of the teaching but in this case you try to teach not to the real person but to the imaginary audience which will be reading your tutorials uh, in order to write tutorial, you need to go through all the steps. You need to check uh, check for many times if you choose the 
good words, if you choose the good sentences, if the structure is uh, well formed, if if someone who reads it can understand it, and it requires a lot. Of, it requires a lot, but with that comes the real understanding. Also, another way which really uh, helps with the way of uh, with the level of understanding is coming up with the examples. As I mentioned uh, earlier, the examples are really helpful, and I also uh, can give you the rule of thumb, which you can use to evaluate someone's knowledge. If someone says that uh, he understands the topic but cannot really come up with one or two examples, I mean meaningful examples, there is a very high chance that the person doesn't understand the topic. And you can use this, uh, this technique to evaluate your own understanding. If every time when you read about some new topic and you think that you know it, try to come up with the examples different from those which you saw in the books, uh, in the book or in the video. If you can't, most likely you need to work a little bit more on that topic. Uh, another, uh, another variation of uh, this way is recording webinars. It doesn't need to be the webinar for the real audience, which is, but uh, even though it's really helpful, it can uh, bring you the, uh, it can bring you the real time feedback. The one which I mentioned uh, in the story with Cassandra and my students, it can bring you the, uh, real-time questions based on the way you described the topic and it can highlight the blind spots it can highlight the gaps which you potentially may miss if it is the recording for the let's say for the youtube without interactive questions and regarding question uh, try to ask as much questions as you can but not just the meaningless question uh, which, uh, which you can answer by picking the, uh, some particular paragraph or the sentence. Try to ask deeper questions. Uh, the one which come to the topic from the different angles, uh, topics which may be uh, questions which may put your topic into the perspective of other topics, of other subjects, of the connections between the topic and and other areas which you already know, everything will help. And once and also regarding writing, uh, writing is really helpful not only for teaching something but also for first of all for structuring your own thought. Uh, probably you hear, probably you noticed the situation in your life that uh, some people when they write either posts or emails, even though the, uh, the text is big, even though you understand each word in particular and the sentence in the whole, but, uh, but together it doesn't really make sense. The words are, the words are strange, the sentences uh, look in the different order and everything doesn't really put up together. Very often, the way how uh, people think represents itself in the way how they write. And the, it works both ways. If you train yourself to write in a clear and, uh, in a clear and uh, understandable manner, it, it will force you to, to articulate your thoughts in the same manner. And also one of the biggest benefits of writing is that it helps you in building so-called, I, I like to call it the cache. So let's say you have, the, you have a lot of ideas, thoughts, and some uh, information in your head. But when you want to communicate it in order to articulate, to formulate it into the meaningful sentences with the meaningful structure, uh, it really takes some time. So during the conversation, your uh, your thoughts and your uh, your speaking may look incoherent. You it may look like you are jumping from one topic to the other, it, and it's because you need to do this articulation on the spot. You need to access this uh, slow, unstructured, tangled ideas and thought and uh, information in your head, then to put it into uh, some 
structure and then you can communicate it. But when you, when you teach yourself to write, to write a lot and write about the, uh, about the things which are interesting to you, which you want to, uh, which you are using constantly, it, uh, you do all this work of formulating, of articulating uh, without the pressure of uh, conversation. You can do it on your own. You can really think through all the uh, thoughts and ideas. And in this way, you put it into some kind of cash. I mean, your mental cash. Because if you wrote about something at least a few times, you, have, you already have the sentences structured. You have the ideas uh, connected together. Probably if, you, if it's related to some topic, you have few examples. So you don't need to come up with examples on the spot. So having it into, in the cache makes you much better speaker and communicator. So every time when you talk to someone and, uh, you, and uh, you bring some topic which you already thought through and which you already wrote about, it's just a matter of accessing this quick cache and, uh, and uh, presenting it in the words already chosen. Of course, it wouldn't work every time. Sometimes you need to do some modifications. You need to connect it to the, uh, to the conversation at hand, but, it's still, uh, but it still saves you a lot of work, a lot of work which you'll do during the writing process. And you know, uh, reading, uh, reading good writing versus bad writing is a huge difference because when you read some good post, good uh, email, it's easy. You just read it and everything is clear. Everything is understand. Everything is uh, understandable. But when you open the uh, badly written uh, prose, like uh, post or email, everything is bad. It's even hard to pinpoint what is the why it's bad because usually the words are. Uh, the words are chosen poorly. The sentences are all over the place. The thoughts come, uh, uh, the thoughts interrupt itself a uh, few times, the paragraph. And, but saying that it's not really helpful. Uh, the way which you can address this, uh, this bad writing, if it's yours or if it's your, some uh, of your colleagues, you, uh, you can approach it with the way how to organize it from the very beginning. You start on thinking about the structure. You start on thinking about the uh, main ideas, about the examples, and then it brings itself into the coherent and beautiful picture. Uh, so that's one of the best ways to improve the way how you learn. So once again, if you if you have enough uh, time and patience use the Feynman technique study explain fill in the gaps reiterate if it's not uh, because of some reasons uh, available to you use these other alternatives and it really make your life easier it will make your process of learning much more efficient and it will help not only you but all the people who are around you specifically those people who will uh, get your explanations because by explaining to other, first of all, you learn it to yourself and you help the other person to understand. So you are hitting two birds with one stone and use that, it will really benefit you. And as I uh, promised you in the beginning of the talk, I, I would like to tell my story how teaching entered my life and how it influenced it. So back in 2013, when I just became a software engineer, when I just started working in programming, I got a really interesting offer. My uh, One of my friends who worked with the one uh, programming school offered if I want to, uh, to do the tutoring in Java. Uh, back then, I uh, Java was my primary language. And as I was a fresh software engineer, all the knowledge and um, uh, all the knowledge in my head were pretty fresh. And it was a great opportunity to earn, uh, or earn some money. Back then I was a student, every, every dollar, every hryvnia was a big help for me. So I agreed to go for this journey of 
tutoring people in Java. And as you may expect, in order to prepare for the lesson and to conduct the lesson and then to answer the question, I had to uh, do I had to do pretty a lot of preparation, even though I thought that my knowledge of Java is good, it turned out that it wasn't. So back then I first learned this, uh, the benefit of teaching and started to use it as much as possible in my everyday life. Of course, I, uh, I would be lying if I say that I learned everything through this way, but still, I tried to employ it as much as possible. So it uh, it was back in 2013, the working as an engineer brought me uh, to teaching. And then after, after six or seven years, when uh, I decided to go on a journey uh, and try myself as an educator in the university, when I contacted the uh, UKU, Ukrainian Catholic University to, and offered my help as a teaching assistant and then as a teacher, uh, I once again learned how helpful it was it is to to do the teaching, how helpful it is in terms of uh, of systematize, systematizing your knowledge, structuring everything in your head. And after spending some time uh, as a teacher in in the at the university on one of the meetings, I. Uh, I get to know one or I get to know my current uh, manager at SoftServe. He uh, he noticed my work at the university and offered that maybe it would be interesting to look at some positions at SoftServe because also SoftServe is uh, really involved in uh, in teaching and making uh, making practical education for students accessible. Uh, so this offer really resonated with me and that's how I end up here at SoftServe and so far it's going good. So that's how it was the, uh, with the gap of eight years first work brought me to teaching and then teaching brought me to my current work. And uh, don't be discouraged about the uh, possible uh, amount of work which this approach requires you get used to it pretty quickly as uh, at the very beginning you weren't proficient in let's say using some foreign language or using your primary uh, programming language with time it becomes easier and easier you learn new patterns you learn new tricks and tips how to organize your work better and each new topic becomes easier and easier to learn so try it it will really help you so that's all in terms of my talk. Are there any questions? 